Hello class. So today we're going to be talking about core values and ethics of organizational development. Uh, as you follow along in the slides, uh, I just have a few things I want to share with you today. I'll keep it brief, uh, but uh, I think there's some important things for us to think about as we take on a role as change agent within an organization and work either as an internal or external consultant. So first I want you to think to our first case study. Think back uh, to that situation. Think about Julie. How would OD values apply to your actions if you were to consult with Julie, the leader, in case study number one? What actions would it imply that you take or avoid taking? I think this is a really important question because as a consultant or as a change agent, either formal or informal within an organization, we're going to have an opportunity to interact with many people. And those interactions can take many forms, and those are shaped by our values. Uh, I have experienced so many times in my life, um, both extremely positive interactions, but also very negative ones. And unfortunately, I, I've probably been a perpetrator of negative behaviors and negative um, words and, and actions uh, towards people from time to time because I have lost sight of my values for a moment uh, and done something that later I'm not proud of. And then I have to go back and mop up clean up, apologize, try to rebuild and uh, rebuild trust and rebuild the relationship. And as a really great um, change agent and consultant, what we want to try to do is avoid those missteps in the first place and have uh, all of our actions guided by these values on a regular basis. So think about your values. Think about the types of values that would inform the way you work with Julie um, or other similar types of situations. And, and hopefully the discussion today uh, in these um, slides and in this video can give you some more to think about in terms of what those values might look like, what types of things might be important to you. First, let's start as we think about values and ethics in OD. Let's think about constraints on behavior. So the first level of constraints that we usually think about in terms of ethics is legal requirements. That's a pretty low bar um, because we know that there are many uh, unethical and immoral laws that are passed. Uh, we have discriminatory laws and, and prejudice laws towards certain populations that hurt people. And I think it would be very difficult to argue that those are moral or um, actually uh, really ethical types of laws. So a legal requirement probably isn't enough to say whether something is good or bad, something is ethical or unethical or moral or immoral. So then we usually go to a, the next level. We look at professional standards. Most professions have some set of standards. Um, the law profession has standards and they have a governing body to make sure that people uh, abide by those ethics. The medical profession has that accounting. Um, there's not anything as, as structured for HR or for OD, but there's still commonly accepted practice and there's commonly accepted norms of what isn't or what is or isn't appropriate. And so we can look to professional standards. We can look to best practices. We can look to our own interactions with people and what we find is positive or negative and then try to live by those standards. And usually that encompasses far more than what we're technically legally required um, to comply with by law. But then that's usually not enough either. Uh, sometimes there's, there's professional standards that maybe don't fit with our own personal values, uh, or maybe we wouldn't feel comfortable for society at large adhering to those sorts of values. Um, so then we have uh, ethical behavior tied to a set of values beyond legal requirements or be beyond professional standards. And, this, and then it, the question becomes, well, what, what are those um, values? What are those ethical values? And that changes from culture to culture. Um, and and that's not just like country-based, right? So we we don't just have a monolith of U.S. culture. We have a lot of uh, many different values across different cultures within the U.S. And you go across the, the world and you see the same thing um, where people just think differently. They have different perspectives about different things that we might hold as a core value. Um, so then that, that opens up a lot of ambiguity as to what's appropriate, inappropriate, when, how do we act? How do we behave? How culturally sensitive do we try to be to people, even when their values differ from our values? Uh, these are all important questions for us to ask, particularly if you're working with a diverse workforce, or you're working with a multinational organization where you have workers across the globe. We have to really think about these things. 
So briefly, I want to remind you of three common ethical perspectives. Now, you've probably learned about these in your ethics and values class um, that every student has to take at UVU, so I don't want to belabor the point on any of these, but it's worth um, revisiting and thinking about briefly. The first broad perspective is utilitarianism, followed by deontology, and then virtue ethics. When you think of utilitarianism, um, this is often seen as the greatest good for the greatest number. Ends justify the means. A moral reasoning based on consequences and an action is good if it maximizes happiness and minimizes pain. Sometimes I think of this as the Jack Bauer form of ethics. So if any of you have seen the show 24, uh, he, he fights terrorism. And uh, so he ends up doing a lot of things that I think most people in a, the normal um, happenings of their day would never even con consider doing. They would see those as very unethical things. But with him trying to save the world um, and, and the fate of the planet and the balance and, and things like that, so then he ends up doing things for the greater good, the greatest good for the greatest number, even if that means he has to hurt somebody or do something that normally he wouldn't feel comfortable doing. I think we find ourselves doing these sorts of things all the time. We justify um, our actions that might hurt a few because we think in the long run it'll help many. Um, that's a very common ethical perspective, uh, and it has its merits. There are good and bad things to each of these perspectives. The next is deontology, a moral reasoning based on duty and principle. So it's an intrinsic aspect of who we are. We have a duty to be ethical. An action is good if it is right and consistent with universal principles of good. So what does society at large say is good? I have a duty to perform and act that way. Uh, sometimes we talk about this perspective in terms of the categorical imperative. I ought never to act ex except in such a way that can also will that my action should become a universal law. So in other words, I, sh I shouldn't ever justify my actions unless I'm comfortable saying every other person around me could do the exact same thing. So I shouldn't lie, cheat, steal, hurt, murder, do any of those types of things, um, even if it's for the greater good, if I'm not comfortable saying that should be a universal law that everyone should be able to lie, cheat, steal, um, do, do those sorts of things. We should act in such a way that you should always treat humanity never simply as a means, but always as an end. So whereas in the utilitarian perspective, where we often talk about the ends justify the means, here we're talking about people are the ends. So we, we need to always act based on our moral duty to do what is right. So from this perspective, we would never hurt somebody, even if the fate of others stood in the balance. Um, the next one is virtue ethics, moral reasoning based on complying with identified virtues or principles. So often we think of what are considered the cardinal virtues of fortitude, temperance, prudence, and justice. Um, in more contemporary terms, we think about honesty, responsibility, respect, fairness, and compassion. This is a focus on the integrity and the character, um, the moral character uh, of individuals rather than specific actions. And it's important for us to maintain integrity uh, and build our character over time. Now, which, which of these perspectives is correct? I, I, I don't think that's the right question. I, I don't think it's a matter of which perspective we should adhere to. It's important for us to recognize that we probably act and behave according to all three of these perspectives from time to time. And ultimately, we need to be self-reflective and think about um, how we behave and why we behave that way and what our core values are and how we prioritize those values. Um, and when push comes to shove, when we sell, find ourselves in sticky situations, in ethical dilemmas, what are we willing to do and what are we not willing to do? When do we just walk away? When do we um, stick around and, and put up a fight? Uh, these are all the types of questions that we need to consider. So in the discussion this week, you'll have an opportunity to consider some of these questions and have some dialogue with your classmates online, um, thinking about your own personal values and how they affect your actions, um, which ones carry greater weight than others, and situations when OD values might be appropriately violated in a consulting agreement. Are there times when, even though lying isn't something you want to do, where perhaps it's necessary to lie in a consulting experience? If so, when would that be? Um, think you, these are just things we need to try to think about so that when we face those situations, we know how we're going to act and respond. 
Now here's a list of some of the common types of OD values that we often think about, and I encourage you to consider as you um, work through your own process of considering your own values, um, assumptions, beliefs about how to properly go about organizational development and change. Um, these are values I feel are very core to OD, participation. So involving people across different styles, across different le levels of leadership, getting everyone involved and bought into the process. I think there's an inherent value in groups and teams. We need to utilize them, we need to let them flourish. Uh, there's a value in the growth mindset and helping to grow and develop and, and foster learning within organizations, within people, groups, and the overall process. This idea of overall human potential. This is something that I buy into and really drives me is the idea of the human capital potential of an organization and how do we leverage that capital, not just in a way that we, you know, I'm not talking about manipulating the capital, not manipulating people to get what you want, but truly fulfilling them and by fulfilling them and, and leveraging that fulfillment, then the organization succeeds. Looking at the holistic and whole person, um, looking at individuals and treating them with dignity and respect. Uh, valuing dialogue and collaboration. And, and I think probably as, as important as anything in OD relationships is fostering authenticity, openness, and trust. If you can't have those elements in how you engage with your clients or with your coworkers and colleagues as you're trying to drive change, uh, change initiatives will fail. Authentic, authentic, authenticity, openness, and trust are just fundamental key um, to any healthy organization and certainly to any um, sustainable change initiative. So here is a model of ethical dilemmas. So it's easy to be ethical when we have a clear black and white choice of like something's really wrong and some here's the right easy right choice the right answer. The problem is the world isn't that simple usually and there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of gray um, area and so then we have to figure out how we're going to deal with that. We have um, so that's that's where moral dilemmas come about and ethical dilemmas. So I need to think about my values, my goals, my needs, my abilities, and then how that influences my role as the agent of change, but also my role um, and the role of the client in the system. That will then inform the process that I go about, how I deal with role conflict, how I deal with role ambiguity, and then ultimately I have to think about the consequences. Um, I have to think about misrepresentation of data, misuse of data, the use of coercion and manipulation, um, value and goal conflict, technical ineptness. There's all these different sorts of elements that can ultimately cause friction and can cause ethical dilemmas as we're working uh, with our clients. And we need to try to think through those in advance. To finish off this week, I thought I would just provide an example of, of, um, of values within an organization that I think are really um, great to think about. Uh, I'm not going to read this for you, but I encourage you to to read um, these two slides, Johnson & Johnson's um, The Credo, which is really their value statement for the organization and how they value customers and their employees. And what I really love about this is that they integrate it into every part of um, the organization from the recruitment and onboarding process of new employees to how they do performance management, how they train and promote, and how they... Um, how they bring about, uh, how, how they deal with their executive level uh, to, to work with employees. These values are core and have been for over 100 years to Johnson & Johnson. And so that's something that, that uh, comes out in policy practice um, and procedures throughout the organization and how they work with everybody. I encourage you to think about this because some of these values might um, resonate with you and they might hold true to you and how you want to work within your organization or how you want to be a consultant. Um, I think the main thing at the end of this brief little video that I would like you to come away with is understanding the need, really the necessity that you um, take time to be critically self-reflective on your own values, on the priority of those values, and think about a system you can put in place to deal with ethical, ethical dilemmas when they arise so that you can be the best possible um, consultant that you can be for organizations. Um, if you can do that, I think you're going to be in, in great shape. And that's all for today.